speech i would like to uh tell you some of the achievements uh and uh, i would like to introduce ca saket modi sir ca saket modi is the founder and director of squel my global consulting a london headquartered financial training and consulting company with operations in india he spe- he specializes in training courses on financial reporting and analysis particularly with regards to international financial reporting standards indian accounting standards and in international public sector accounting standards he has spent considerable time working advising and training on complex matters like relating to ifrs he has designed and facilitated courses for finance and non finance professionals from over 50 countries in europe africa middle east asia and the caribbean he previously worked with lloyds bank and ernest and young in addition to being a chartered accountant saket sir is also a cfa chartered holder thank you so much sir i hope we are good to go okay yeah, thank you very much uh, for that kind uh, introduction and uh, good morning everyone welcome to this session uh, first of all hope uh, you are all well and safe um i know it's uh, it's a sunday morning and uh, uh, i must thank you for taking the time out to uh, you know learn a bit more uh, review ifrs uh, if you have any questions at any point uh, or if i'm not audible then feel free to let me know uh, put it in the chat box but i can promise you uh, this is quite an interactive session um i will be asking questions and uh, give you the opportunity to reply don't worry about whether the answer is right or wrong the purpose is to learn so that's what um, we would we will be doing um we just sorry just get the make sure it's the right one i've got uh i'm sorry i'm just probably got the wrong one uh okay so let's um start i've already been introduced so i won't go into those details um and um if you want to connect with me i am on linkedin uh, we also have a youtube channel uh, which is square mile global consulting there are some videos on ifrs if you would like to go through those including some on career opportunities but what we'll do is just uh, you know uh, go through an overview of ifrs uh, what is it what are the key components of financial statements and um uh, also as we go along we'll you know tackle some simple questions and also look at real life financial statement but just a quick overview here on uh, accounting frameworks we have the international financial reporting standards Uh, which are widely used they are principles based standards and the indian version of it is called the indas or the indian accounting standards which most of you should be aware about then we have the us gap which are rules based mostly us companies follow that uh, and then we have the national accounting standards for small non listed companies which have less onerous requirements compared to ifrs and us gap generally ifrs us gap are for listed companies though the large private companies uh, may also follow uh, those standards but the key difference to note between ifrs and us gap is that uh, ifrs is a principles based standards us gap is rules based and when you have principles based standards there's more elements of judgments and estimates uh, involved and while we are on there if if you are a foreign company so if you are a non us company uh, and are listed on the us exchange then you are allowed to file ifrs financial statements you don't have to follow um, us us gap so international financial reporting standards this is the statement made by hans hugerwost of uh, who is the chairman of the international accounting standards board 
And uh, these standards are followed in 140 plus countries, so more than half the world. So truly global financial reporting standards. But what I like to highlight here is just some of the key elements that he's mentioned here. So first of all, it's about transparency, enhancing the international compatibility and quality of financial information. And all these are important because the ultimate objective of financial statements is to enable us to make informed economic decisions. Yeah. So this is the statement from Hans Ugerwurst and the logo you see is the of the International Accounting Standards Board. It's the IFRS. Uh, the International Account Accounting Standards Board itself is is uh, based in London, uh, but it's an independent standard setting body, nothing to do with UK. It's just uh, got its head office in, in London. Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, bring up a poll question, which I'd like you to answer. So the first one, just have a look at the first one. How many IFRS standards can be applied in 2020? Yeah. So just make a selection, take a guess. Go for it. I think only one of you has answered. Yeah, there's second one. So I'll just wait till a few more answer. Take a guess. I think six, six of the 18 have answered. So just give you 20 more seconds. I think some of you still haven't answered, so just take a few seconds. I do need you all to participate, so do make a selection. Don't worry, I won't know what you've selected, but we'll just see uh, the results in a bit. So just take for 10 more seconds, yeah. Just the first one, how many IFRS standards can be applied in 2020? Okay. Um, the second one, I think some of you've answered that. Uh, information in financial statements where confirmatory value, predictive value are both. This statement represents the qualitative characteristic of, again, we'll go through that in a bit, but do make sure you answer, select one of them. And the third one is about a new standard from last year, leases, a big change in IFRS. Uh, we've had that change in INDAS also. The adoption of IFRS 16 has maximum impact on which one of the following? Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I'll give you again 30 seconds just to finish off and then we'll review the answers.
All right, five more seconds, and then I'm going to end the polling. Okay, I'm going to end the polling now. And share the results. So hopefully you can see the results. How many IFRS standards can be applied in 2020? Uh, the correct answer is 41. So when we say IFRS, there is the IAS, the International Accounting Standards, and the IFRS, uh, which are the International Financial Reporting Standards. Uh, the difference being that IAS are standards that were issued prior to uh, 2001, uh, and the ones published since then is referred to as IFRS, but both need to be applied. So the correct answer is 41. Uh, obviously, in addition to IFRSs and IAS, we also have interpretations, and there's about 20 interpretations, which is also uh, to be followed by preparers of IFRS financial statements. The information in the financial statements may have confirmatory value, predictive value of both. This statement represents the qualitative characteristic of uh, the correct answer here is relevance. Um, some of you may have got faithful representation, but it's actually relevance. And though financial statements mostly provide historical information, uh, they are used by the different users as a basis for predicting the future, because the past is always a good prediction of the future. Maybe not, but generally it is used in that manner. So any information that gives predictive, creates predictive value, helps people predict the future is always useful. And the reason I brought this question in is because it's very much relevant in the current environment. If you look at um, the impact of COVID-19 on the companies, there is an impact on business, there is an impact on financial statements. And what users would be interested to know is not just what's happened in up to March or June, but also what is the management's view about the future. And there will be a note disclosure in financial statements about going concern is the company a going concern or not? And that is relevant information. Uh, so again, uh, these are the qualitative characteristics. There's a couple of them more, but relevance, faithful representation are uh, the two fundamental ones. And then you have understandability, comparability, uh, verifiability uh, also as other uh, characteristics. And the third one is the adoption of IFRS 16 leases, uh, which has been effective since 2019, has maximum impact on which one of the following? Uh, and uh, the correct answer is actually lessees with IAS 17 operating leases, the first one. Now, uh, do bear in mind that when you have operating leases, uh, you probably have learned that uh, you recognize only the rental expense. So whatever payments are made to the lessor, the one who rents out the asset, um, who owns the asset and rents out, uh, those are treated as rental expense. Uh, but what the new standard requires is a recognition of a right of use asset and a lease liability, even if it is an operating lease, because in substance, what the lessee has is effectively a right of use asset and an obligation to pay the lease rentals for the agreed period of time, the non cancellable lease period at, at the minimum. So what we see under IFRS 16 is all leases coming on the balance sheet. Yeah, uh, most leases coming on the balance sheet. There are some exemptions, but most leases coming on 
the balance sheet. So we will have an asset and a liability recognized like we would have done for finance lease. But the impact, the maximum impact is on lessees with operating leases. So here's the poll results. Um, so as I said, just if you want to note it down, the first one, how many IFRS standards? 41. Um, the qualitative characteristic, which talks about confirmatory predictive value is relevance. And the impact of IFRS 16 is primarily on lessees with IAS 17 operating leases. Right, so moving on, why is IFRS important? Now, when I say IFRS in India, it's referred to as IND AS, the Indian Accounting Standards. And for the purpose of this session, you can say they are similar. There are some small differences, but for the purpose of this session and what we are going to cover, it is quite similar, um, I would say. So you can assume it's the same thing. But IFRS is not just for accountants. It's not just for those sitting in uh, accounting firms and uh, doing audit of IFRS financial statements. Uh, I used to work with uh, a bank in London, Lloyds Bank, and the, I used to work in a, in, in a in a department that was a structured transactions group. Now, what we had were certain transactions with other financial institutions which were entered into either uh, for tax benefit or they were entered into uh, to get cheap funding and so on. Now, what we had was a lot of entities, subsidiaries of the banks that were set up as special purpose entities. And uh, it had, there was complex accounting. There was financial instruments, all the banking stuff that was involved, but there was a lot of complex accounting. And we used to have uh, somebody in the accounting policy team actually write up the technical accounting memos to explain to the business the impact of entering into the transactions on the financial statements. Yeah, so this is the business asking the accountants the impact of entering into a transaction on the financial statements before they close the transaction. So business needs to know, management needs to know, uh, MBAs need to know because they analyze financial statements if they are working as analysts, investment bankers, and obviously as students, we study about it but also chartered accountants need to know about it. So if you are dealing or aspiring to deal with large corporates, multinational companies, listed companies, consolidated financial statements, then you do need IFRS knowledge. This is like the global accounting language. So uh, again, very much uh, relevant. Okay. so. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, just give you a minute or so if you want to go through this question. And uh, what I like you to do is um, uh, I'll, I'll unmute you in a few seconds, but um, maybe if you want to, then, um, you know, let us know the answer. So which of the following are components of IFRS financial statements? Um, or you can say which ones are not components of IFRS financial statements. So I have uh, I have unmuted you. Um, yeah. Uh, so someone's put in the chat box. Uh, director's report and auditor's report are not part of IFRS financial statements. Uh, any other thoughts? Anyone? 
Yeah, uh, Gia, you've raised your hand, so. Uh, sir, statement of PNL, statement of financial position, statement of changes in equity, cash flow statements, and note oh. to financial statement will will be the components of IRS financial statements. IFRS okay. financial statements. So you said we leave out director's report, auditor's report, and the statement of other comprehensive income. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Any other thoughts? Okay, uh, so yeah, Sanskar, do you want to say something? You raised your hand. So somebody says statement of changes in equity, director's report, auditor's report, and OCI will not form part of IFRS financial statements. Uh, me, let me, okay, Sanskar, uh, let me just see if I can unmute you. Yeah, I've unmuted you. But, uh, director's report. Yeah, director's report. Director's report. Okay, yeah. Okay, so... Um, So um, you are, I think, uh, between all of you, we've got it right. So which one of the followings or which of the following are components? So director's report is not a component. Yeah. But the statement of p &L is statement of other comprehensive income is also a component. We will look at that. It's another statement where certain items of gains and losses are recognized, which don't go into the p &L. Uh, Balance sheet or statement of financial position is, uh, and again, IFRS, the standards refer to the term statement of financial performance for p &L or income statement, statement of financial position rather than balance sheet, but you can use balance sheet also. Statement of changes in equity is also required. It is a component of IFRS financial statements. Cash flow statement is mandatory. Uh, notes obviously are required. They give more information about these, uh, about the numbers in the primary statements. Auditor's report is not. So director's report and auditor's report are not part of IFRS financial statements. All others are, and we will go through them uh, shortly. So before we go into that, remember just to, this might be a recap for most of you, but uh, we have fundamental accounting assumptions, which are going concern. Uh, and accrual basis. Now, accrual basis is quite straightforward. We recognize transactions as they occur, yeah, uh, not when cash is received or uh, paid. So it's not cash basis, it's accrual basis of accounting. We assume that uh, and we follow that. Most entities would follow that. Going concern is something that is very important. Uh, we may have... Uh, uh, we may have uh, probably not worried about it too much uh, apart from our studies, but in the current environment where we have this huge impact of COVID-19 uh, on companies, you know, will they continue in operation for the next 12 months for the foreseeable future or not? Uh, I think it's, uh, it's a, a very relevant area. And unless you are, uh, you know, a pharma company, uh, which is doing fine um, in this crisis, or if you are a high tech company, like a Google or Amazon or so on, um, you, you probably don't need to worry about going concern. But all other entities would need some disclosure about going concern in its 2020 financial statements, whether it's interim reports or whether it is the annual financial statements. 
and and that is probably just explaining that look you've got access to funding you've got enough cash or you've got access to funding uh, from the bank to continue to operate to and and you should be able to demonstrate that you've got enough cash for the next 12 months or 18 months to continue in operation. Uh, so these are the two fundamental accounting assumptions. Uh, consistency, I think uh, one of you raised a question. Uh, consistency, yes, it is important. Uh, how we present information uh, should be consistent from year to year. Uh, it helps in comparability, but in the standards, when we look at the fundamental assumptions, it is going concern and accrual basis. Consistency is a bit more like a qualitative characteristic that we would have. So again, I've got another question here. Um, it's about the income statement and uh, OCI. Um, which one of the following is correct with regards to earnings per share? Yeah, earnings per share. So EPS, EPS reflects the amounts distributed as dividends to the shareholders. EPS is calculated based on PNL and excludes gains and losses in OCI, or is calculated based on total gains recognized in PNL and the OCI, or EPS must be presented by all companies that follow IFRS. So if you want to either write in the chat box or raise your hand and I can unmute you. One correct answer. Yeah, so we've got a few option Bs. Yeah, four of you have said option B. Yeah. So just give a few more seconds to others to respond. Right, I think uh, quite a few of you have said option B, um, which which uh, says that EPS is calculated based on the profit and loss and excludes gains and losses recognized in the OCI. Oh, we've got A also, somebody who said A, uh, good. So um, just a bit of a background on that. Um, Yes, the correct answer is uh, B, but EPS is a, again, an important figure, but not all companies that follow IFRS need to present EPS. It is a requirement for listed companies and uh, those who are planning to list their securities on the exchange would disclose that. So if there are private companies that follow IFRS, they don't need to present EPS. There is a standard IAS 33, which deals with calculation of EPS. We won't go into that, but the importance of EPS is it helps you compare. Yeah. So if you have two companies with different profits, profit figures and different numbers of shares issued, then this will tell you what is the earnings per share. Yeah, so a great uh, measure for shareholders, investors, owners of the companies. And um, you might also have uh, heard about the PE ratio, the price to earnings ratio. So the price to earnings ratio is the market price per share divided by the earnings per share. So this also is an input into the calculation of the PE ratio, uh, which is often used uh, in uh, valuations. Yeah. So re remember the price to earnings ratio. The earnings is effectively your earnings per share. 
So this is comparing the price to earnings ratio is comparing the market price per, uh, per share to the actual earnings, which is based on your financial statements. So yes, EPS is calculated based on PNL. It excludes gains and losses recognized in the OCI. So what we're going to do is just look at a, a sample financial statement. And I've just picked an international company here, um, Carnival PLC. And I do want to touch upon the impact of COVID-19 a bit, which line items are affected. Um, so if you are reviewing financial statements, if you're doing an audit, or uh, maybe if you are looking for um, you know, a job and want to go for an interview, at least you can talk a little bit about, about these things. So um, Carnival PLC is effectively a company that operates cruise liners, the ships, you know, the cruise ships. And uh, this is actually their interim report. It's not audited, uh, but don't worry about the audit. We're looking at IFRS. And it is actually for the six months ended 31st May 2020. And that is a period after a part of the period is after this coronavirus pandemic. So what you find here is revenues and you can see the impact of it. Um, the revenues for those six months, how they have reduced because obviously from the middle of March to end of May, you know, the ships are not operating because of the coronavirus pandemic. And you can see that compared to the same six months of the prior year, uh, we've seen uh, there's a marked reduction in revenue. And that is mainly because of the COVID-19 impact. What you also find here is uh, some impairments. And you can see that those impairments were not there in the previous six month period, six month period of the previous year, but they we do have it in 2020. Goodwill is impaired. That's generally one of the first things to be impaired when, when you assess and measure impairment and ship and other impairments. Obviously the ships are not operating. Uh, and, and as a result, there is a write off in their value. Yeah, but this is an IFRS format. So what you can see here is revenues, and then you can see operating costs and expenses. Yeah. Now, uh, when it comes to expenses, there is an option to present the expenses based on the nature of expense or the function of expense. Yeah. So the options are you can present it as nature of expense or function of expense. Yeah. Now, this is an example of a nature of expense. So, you know, what type of expense is it? It's commissions, transportation, onboard expenses on the ships, payroll, fuel, food. That is nature of expense. Yeah. If you had a PNL presented in the form that we perhaps have learned in our college say for example, revenues less cost of goods sold gives you gross profit. And then you have administrative expenses, operating expenses, selling distribution expenses and so on. That would be the function of expense. Normally you find it presented as nature of expense but function of expense can also be used if it gives more relevant information. Yeah. And uh, also, then you find some non-operating items. One thing that IFRS says you should not use is extraordinary. The term extraordinary should not be used. So there is nothing like extraordinary 
uh, in IFRS. You know, there is always a risk of doing business. And that's where, um, you know, uh, you say, well, all expenses are kind of your normal operating uh, ordinary expenses. Um, you may have non-operating expenses or income like you see in the statement, but uh, they are part of ordinary activities of the entity. So uh, nothing like extraordinary, that term is not used, should not be used, but you may have sometimes companies disclose exceptional items. And what you find here at the end is also the earnings per share. Yeah. And you can see here that it's actually negative uh, for, for the six months to 31st May 2020 because of the impact of COVID-19. It was positive earlier, it's negative. And both basic and diluted earnings per share must be disclosed. So diluted earnings is taking into account instruments that may be converted to shares in the future. Yeah, because in the future, there'll be more shares and hence the earnings per share would be lower. Now, OCI, what is OCI? Other Comprehensive Income Statement. So you, you've got certain items of gains and losses, which the standards say should not be in the PL. They should be outside of the PL let's say because they are not part of the normal ordinary activities yeah uh, they are i would say mostly unrealized gains and losses yeah so what we have is instead of recognizing those directly in equity they pass through a statement called other comprehensive income which helps the users the reviewers understand uh, those items properly. So if we take an example here, uh, there is one item here, which is remeasurements of post-employment benefit obligations. This is to do with pensions. Yeah. So, or, or post-employment, maybe healthcare and so on. So when you have pensions, which are obligations payable to former employees on their retirement, and those pensions are guaranteed, uh, then the risk is with the employer. There's actuarial valuations involved, and any actuarial gains and losses flow through the OCI. Or if you have a foreign subsidiary or a foreign entity whose financial statements are prepared in a different currency, then on consolidation, they will be translated uh, to the functional currency. In with this case, it is the dollars. And any gains or losses are re recognized in OCI. So this is the translation of the financial statements of foreign operations, uh, which um, result in gains and losses flowing through OCI. But what you will also find and thing to note about it is there are two components here. One is items that will not be reclassified to income statement or PNL in the future, and items that may be reclassified to income statement in the future. So what it also tells the user is that um, there are certain gains and losses which are recognized in OCI. They will get transferred to PNL perhaps in the future let's say when that foreign operation is disposed of and that might impact the EPS. Yeah. So again, gains and losses, probably not the ordinary activities, but you might still want to look at the OCI to see what those items are. And then the sum of what you have in the PNL and the OCI is the total comprehensive income. So I mentioned a bit about the classification presentation of expenses in the PNL, which one provides more relevant information, nature of expense or function of expense. But if you use a function of expense, you still are required to disclose in the notes certain items like cost of uh, 
sales, depreciation, amortization, employee benefits, and so on. So still the information about the nature of expenses required, some of them. So in this case, uh, is this nature of expense or function of expense? If you want to just put your, put your thoughts in the chat box. So just give you a minute. Okay, I'll, I'll go through the difference again, nature of expense or function of expense. I'll go through the difference again. But just put your thoughts, uh, those of you who have followed, what is the difference? Uh, we'll go through again, but um, if you just have a go at saying whether this is nature of expense or function of expense. Let's give you a few more seconds. Right, a few of you have uh, replied. Uh, so I'll just go through uh, this again, uh, the difference. Now, this is actually an example of function of expense. Yeah. So the classification of expense is based on functions. So here, what we have is a format which is revenue, less cost of sales, gross profit, maybe some other income. And then you've got distribution costs, administrative expenses, other expenses, and your profit figure. So why is it called a classification based on function? Because cost of sales, what has it got to do with? It's, it's to do with the revenue. Yeah, it's got to do with the direct cost of generating revenue. Then you have distribution costs. That is to do with selling, distribution, and so on. And then you've got all the administrative expenses, the operational expenses, uh, like, like office, utilities, all of that. So those are referred to as function of expense. What we don't know here is the actual total cost by nature of expense. So for example, if I wanted to know what is the total employee cost, what is the staff cost uh, in the organization, it doesn't tell me that. So employee cost depreciation is like a nature of expense. Rent is a nature of expense, yeah? What we have here is a function of expense. And what that means is, let's say for example, let's take depreciation, yeah? We all understand depreciation. That's the reduction in the value of the asset because of normal wear and tear. Now, if it is depreciation due to, let's say, machinery in the factory, it will go into the cost of sales figure. If it is due to uh, office equipment, it perhaps goes into administrative expenses. Another example, let's take um, employee wages, salaries. If it relates to production staff, it will end up in cost of sales. If it relates to office staff, it will end up in administrative expenses. So here the classification of depreciation employee costs is based on the function of expense. So whatever relates to production goes into cost of sales, whatever relates to offices goes into administrative expenses. Yeah, so that is an example of a uh, function of expense. If I just go back uh, the slide where we had the PNL, you see here 
we've got the actual nature of expense. So when we say here, for example, payroll, yeah, payroll, all the total staff cost is in one line, yeah, whatever that staff uh, cost relate, uh, wherever that staff works. So that is nature of expense. Fuel, food is nature of expense. Yeah, food obviously because this is a cruise ship, they serve food, so there's quite a huge expense on there. Um, so, so that's where it is. Normally, you will find classification uh, as nature, but uh, you may also find function. And the standard says it could be either, but you must you can use the function of expense classification if it gives more relevant, reliable information. Yeah. So there is an option and uh, you might find either of them. But again, just to recap, even if you have the function of expense classification, um, disclose information on the nature of expenses, including cost of sales, depreciation, amortization and employee benefits. So you still have to disclose some additional information. Right, um, if you have any questions, then feel free to put it in the chat box or raise your hand. I'll be happy to answer those. So if I give you a couple of minutes, have a read through this question. It is about purchase of land and revaluation of land. Where does the revaluation gain go? and how is it subsequently uh, treated on disposal of the asset? So which one is the correct answer? Yeah, just take a couple of minutes. Yeah, so we've got few answers coming through on the chat. Um, let's go with your instinct if you don't know. Let's give you 30 more seconds. Right, so um, here we have got purchase of land for 50,000 CU is just currency unit. It could be INR, dollars, euros, whatever it is. So entity purchases land for 50,000 on 1st July XO, uh, follows the policy of revaluing land Remember, it's not mandatory, but there is an option to revalue land. Uh, and at the balance sheet date of 31st March X1, which is a few months later, the fair value is 75. And then on 1st of April, it is disposed of. So first of all, we've got a gain of 25,000, 
on 31st March X1, we need to recognize that gain. We need bump up the value of the land and we need to recognize a gain somewhere. Now this is, um, you know, uh, I think you, you some of uh, some of you may have assumed that this is a part of property plant equipment. So this might be purchase of land to construct a building for office purposes. And in that case, guess if it's part of IAS 16 property plant equipment, then you would recognize the gain in OCI and on disposal, it is not transferred or recycled to the PNL because this is not really a gain from ordinary activities. Yeah. So revaluation of fixed assets, if there is a gain, it goes through OCI and ends up in equity as revaluation reserve. When it is disposed of, that revaluation reserve may be transferred within equity to retained earnings because it's realized now, but not recycle it to PNL. Um, if, for example, this was investment property, uh, IAS um, 40 investment property, which is property which is held for capital appreciation, then that gain is recognized in PNL. Yeah. So if it was investment property, it's recognized in PNL. Yeah. So it does depend on the standard. Um, you know, there's all options have been selected, uh, but B and D are definitely not correct. A or C, it depends on what type of property it is. So you might need some information on that. And uh, just to also explain whether it's PNL uh, or whether it's balance sheet, there are certain line items that are mandatory to be disclosed on the face of the financial statement. So for example, if you have finance cost, it must be shown as a separate line item uh, on, on the PNL. If you have investment property, if you have property, plant and equipment, each of those should be shown as separate line items on the balance sheet. So the users know what those items are um, effectively. When we look at balance sheet, uh, we have this equation, assets equals liabilities and equity. So assets are your investments, liabilities and equities where the funding comes from. Liabilities is generally debt funding, equity is owner's capital, yeah. And generally what you find in a presentation of balance sheet is a current, non-current presentation. So current assets, current liabilities, um, non-current assets, non-current liabilities. But sometimes you might also find a presentation in the order of liquidity, which is normally with financial institutions. So order of liquidities, you don't use current, non-current presentation. You do it uh, assets and all your assets are, in, uh, are together, um, but they are in the order of liquidity. So for example, cash might appear first because that's very liquid and then your PPNE might be right at the end because that's less very, it's not liquid. You're not really gonna sell that. Um, so, uh, or you could do it the other way around, start with PPNE and uh, show cash at the end. But normally financial institutions do it in the order of liquidity because that's very important for them. For example, banks, uh, corporates, you generally see current and non-current classification. Right, so what I'm gonna do here is um, think about these people. Um, we'll first try and identify those people, but the key question here is who could be an asset on a balance sheet? Yeah, who could be an asset on a balance sheet? So we know the, who the first person is. Uh, I won't uh, go into that, uh, but would, would 
Amitabh Bachchan be an asset on a balance sheet? Ever? Yes, no? Let me just do one thing. Uh, I'll just try and unmute you all. So if you if you're going to have any background noise, just mute yourself. But uh, yeah. Or or you can you can put right in the chat box also, uh, or raise your hand. But would uh, Amitabh Bachchan be an asset on a balance sheet? Yeah, Gia, you want to say something? Uh, so we, if we have paid advertisement expense for a brand ambassador to Amitabh Bachchan and the benefit is yet to be received or it has, it has not exhausted yet, it can be an asset in the name of prepaid expense. So yeah, that is a, uh, you are right. And that will be an asset, but that will be like a prepayment. Uh, what I'm saying, what I'm trying to say is, would there be an asset saying, Amitabh Bachchan on a balance sheet. Uh, that's what I was trying to I was trying to say, um, and and um, I think what you said is absolutely right. But um, uh, you won't have Amitabh Bachchan as an asset. It's the prepayment which would be an asset. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So again, the way Amitabh Bachchan works is probably you know um, he gets a fee for uh, acting in a movie or doing a show or being uh, uh, an ambassador and uh, that's more like a consultancy fee. Yeah, so that's what's recognized as revenue. Uh, what an asset, what is required in an asset is not just ownership, not necessary you need an ownership, what you need is control. So the question is, does anyone uh, have a right to control uh, Amitabh Bachchan uh, in that sense. And uh, when he acts in a movie or when uh, he's a brand ambassador, no, it's more like a consultancy arrangement. There is no, there is a contract, but no control over um, Amitabh Bachchan for a long period of time. Yeah. So Amitabh Bachchan would not be an asset on a balance sheet. Uh, 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 per se. What about, who's the second person? Anyone? Indira Nui. Yeah, so Indira Nui, yeah, former chairman, um, chairman of Pepsi. PepsiCo, yeah. So uh, would she be an asset on PepsiCo's balance sheet, for example, when she was the CEO? When she, the chairman, CEO of PepsiCo, um, you know, very smart lady, um, but would she be an asset on the balance sheet? No, because she is still an employee, yeah? And PepsiCo does not really control her. Yeah. So she can still give a notice and resign. Yeah. But the other issue is not just about control. It's also about, yeah, very valuable person to the company. But how do you measure that value? And if you can't measure it, you can't actually recognize it on the balance sheet. Yeah. So again, that person would not be, um, Indra Nui would not be an asset. Employees would not be an asset on the balance sheet because organizations don't control them and uh, they also, uh, the value cannot be measured reliably. Okay, does anyone know who the third person is? So the third person is actually um, a lady called Sena Marie. Sena Marin is the prime minister of Finland, a 
a very young lady. She ha she became the prime minister of Finland last year at the age of 34 years. Yeah. So uh, again, uh, would she be an asset on a balance sheet? She's a head of a state, but she doesn't appear as an asset on the balance sheet. Yeah. Because again, when we when it comes to asset, we are looking at control. We are looking at future benefits, which can be measured. And here they cannot be measured. And again, normally with assets, you know, you buy something, you pay a price for it. And that is the value of the asset. And, uh, you know, here with all these three that we've discussed, you can't really do that. The fourth person is, you should know this. Well, fourth person is Cristiano Ronaldo. So he now plays football for Juventus, the Italian club. And um, in his case, actually, there is, um, there is a market, you know, so there is a transfer market in Europe in football. So when Juventus buys, for example, Cristiano Ronaldo, they pay, let's say, for example, Real Madrid, a price for it. Yeah. And that is the price to purchase Cristiano Ronaldo to have a contract with him for say five years or three years or whatever it is. And that is effectively an asset. So that is the right to use the services of Cristiano Ronaldo, which is an asset on the balance sheet. Yeah. Uh, but that is possible because there is a transfer market. And obviously, Ronaldo would be paid a huge salary for playing for Juventus, and that would be the salary expense for the club. So Ronaldo could be an asset on the balance sheet of the football club that has purchased him. Yeah. So again, this was just to explain that an asset, we need control. And we also need um, the ability to measure it reliably. Otherwise, you can't recognize it. Right, another question. So moving on to liabilities, an environmental damage claim of 5,000 has been filed against an entity. Uh, entity has internal policy to settle claims which are under 10,000 without going to court. It has always followed the policy in the past for such claims and is expected to settle this claim. Which one of the following is correct? A, B, or C? So do, do you have a provision, contingent liability, or neither of those? So if you again put it in the chat box. Right, so here, um, you know, some of you have replied. Uh, so which one of the following is correct? Now, when it comes to recognizing a provision, uh, we, can, we need an obligation. The difference to a payable is that in case of a provision, we don't know uh, exactly what the amount would be or when it would be payable. So there's uncertainty in a provision with regards to the amount or the timing. Now, when it comes to provision, they are of two types. We can have a legal provision, which is by virtue of law, or we can have what is called a constructive obligation. And what we have here is a constructive obligation based on the published policies and past practices of the entity. And in this case, the entity is expected to settle this claim. It has a published policy. It is most likely going to do that. And hence, we would recognize a provision 
rather than disclose it just as a contingent liability. And this is based on constructive obligation. There's no legal requirement to do so. You can still go to the court, but that's not what the entity is likely to do. It is likely to settle the obligation and hence the provision of 5,000 is required. Now, um, contingent liabilities are only disclosed uh, and they are less likely uh, to result in an outflow compared to a provision. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, one of you asked about going through that Ronaldo example again. So just to be clear, uh, what I was trying to explain about Cristiano Ronaldo is in, in Europe, there is a transfer market for football players. So clubs own football players and they would then effectively transfer them or sell them to another club and the club which buys actually pays the selling club a price for that football player. Somebody like Cristiano Ronaldo, probably the best or one of the best football players in the world would fetch, you know, a few uh, tens of millions of, of, of uh, uh, dollars or euros or so and so on. So when the club buying club pays that price to purchase, it is like buying an asset because they have a contract for a few years, three to five years uh, over which they will be able to use Cristiano Ronaldo in the way that they want. So they in a way effectively control, control, um, uh, control the, control the um, um, player. And that is why it is recognized as an asset. Uh, okay, so moving on, I'll just quickly run through this. Uh, I think most of you should be quite clear about, about this. So I said uh, about the balance sheet that uh, the asset is classified here as current, non-current. Obviously it doesn't mention non-current, but um, most of these PPNE right of use assets, which is to do with leases, goodwill are non-current assets. And similarly, Carnival, the cruise liner, whose PNL we saw earlier, they have classified liabilities as current and long-term, which is non-current effectively. Uh, and then um, I just want to touch upon very briefly on leases. Um, I asked you a poll question earlier uh, and we have a new standard IFRS 16 on leases wherein most leases will come on the balance sheet. And uh, you can see here, there's a building, laptop, photocopier and an airplane. Uh, these are all assets that could be leased and uh, most assets come on the balance sheet like building aeroplane would be on the balance sheet as right of use asset and obligation to pay their lease rentals. Laptops, photocopiers, uh, you may be able to take the exemption because they are considered low value assets and low value is generally assets which are less than 5,000 US dollars. Um, that's what's used as a practice, but you can, um, you know, you can, um, uh, take, uh, take the exemption in which case you don't recognize an asset or a liability, but you only recognize a, a rental expense in the p &L. Yeah. Uh, but again, just uh, thinking more from a business commercial perspective, you know, you could buy an asset if you have cash, or you could take a loan from the bank and buy an asset, or you could lease it. And leasing is a bit like borrowing money. Yeah. But sometimes, I think the benefit of leasing is that the agreement can be customized. You might get a better rate on a leased asset. And with leasing, the main advantage to the lessee is that uh, the risk, the residual value risk uh, remains with the owner, the lessor. Yeah. So if you are concerned about technological changes making your asset obsolete, then you could lease it. Uh, because at the end of the term, the asset goes back to the lessor and that's the person who has to worry about uh, obsolescence, not the 
not the uh, lessee. So that's one of the benefits of, of leasing. But that's what's going to happen. Uh, IS-17 is out now. So it is replaced by IFRS-16. And basically what IFRS-16 does is removes the distinction between operating and finance lease and treats all leases like finance lease wherein asset liability is recognized and the asset is always depreciated. So you have depreciation on the asset and on the liability you have interest expense. So that's what would be recognized. But remember that the amounts you pay to the lessor does not change. It still stays the same. It's the accounting which is changing. Um, and then um, just going through um, the statement of changes in equity, all it does is reconciles the opening balance of equity to the closing balance of equity, but it is split into the different components of equity. So for example, uh, you have share capital, you have share premium, retained earnings, there is some translation reserve here and so on. Yeah. And if there are dividends paid by the company, remember they are a deduction from equity. So dividends paid are directly reduced from equity. They reduce the retained earnings. Yeah. They don't go into the bottom of the PL and so on in IFRS. They are a deduction from the retained earnings in equity. So if you want to know how much dividends have been paid, look at the statement of changes in equity. Cash flow statement, I think this is perhaps uh, something that you're most familiar with. Uh, it reconciles the cash and cash equivalents in the balance sheet. And it tells you about the sources of cash and the uses of cash. And you know, in the current COVID-19 environment, you still have um, uh, this as a very important uh, statement because what people are concerned about is how much cash do we have to continue in operation? How long can we continue in operation uh, based on the current uh, demand in the market uh, and the cost that we have? And we have the classification into operating, investing and financing activities. So here we have Carnival PLC. Uh, this is just cash flows from operating activities. Now in IFRS, the direct method where you show the actual receipts from sale of goods, payments to suppliers, payments to employees and so on is recommended. But most people use the indirect method which is actually shown here. So we have the indirect method which is shown here. Yeah, it starts from the PNL and then reconciles the non-cash items, removes the effect of that, and uh, accounts for the changes in working capital to get the cash flow from operations. And this is what you would normally find. Uh, notes to the financial statements: uh, We have the basis of preparation. So when you go to the notes. Uh, the initial part in the notes will tell you on what basis the financial statements have been prepared, whether it is IFRS or not. So in case of Carnival PLC, the financial statements we have been looking at, it is the international financial reporting standards. So that's what they will tell you. Um, I'll send you all these slides so uh, you can have a read through it. What is also important in the notes is um, apart from all your detailed uh, analysis of the numbers in the financial statements is um, a, a bit to do with estimates. Yeah. So the management acknowledges that there are estimates and assumptions required in preparation of financial statements. And there could be revision to those estimates and assumptions. So what are those? that will be, you will come to know from the notes to the financial statements. And what I would really watch out for is the significant estimates um, that are required. Yeah. And again, impact of COVID-19 should be mentioned by companies this year. 
and what are their plans, whether they consider the entity to be a going concern or not. If it is not a going concern, it's a slight problem because then the financial statements are prepared on a different basis. But here, you know, they have said, look, we've got, um, you know, some bookings, we've got access to funding, we've got enough cash, there is liquidity. Uh, one of the things many companies have done because of COVID-19 to preserve cash is stop paying dividends. So we're not paying dividends to shareholders. Uh, it's not mandatory. So uh, they preserve cash and they continue to be a going concern. They have sufficient liquidity to satisfy their obligations for the next 12 months. Uh, not saying Carnival's going to do that for the long term, but again, what they mentioned here is the steps taken to manage liquidity and ensure there is enough cash to continue in operation. So um, again, um, this these are uh, you know th this is a note that you should look out for. Um, what I like to do is um, just spend a few minutes on uh, career opportunities. So just to give you again a bit of my background, I've spent you know the last. 15 years mainly working on IFRS, International Financial Reporting and Analysis. So I do consulting work, I also do mostly training, yeah, and that is training for banks, financial institutions, corporates, and so on. Now, as a chartered accountant, you know, you come across lots of opportunities. Sometimes it is confusing. There's probably a lot of noise in the market. Oh, do this, there's good scope, or GST has come or, you know, India has come and so on. But first thing I would say is, you know, first try and identify your passion. You know, that is quite important because as a chartered accountant, what do you want to do? Do you want to do more accounting analysis, financial analysis? Do you want to go more into tax and within tax? Do you want to go into indirect tax? Do you want to go into direct tax? Do you want to go into transfer pricing and so on? Or do you just want to do something very different, uh, maybe, you know, m &A or become an investment banker and so on. The opportunities are, 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 are huge. Um, but uh, what I would say is from a India sort of IFRS perspective, look, these are global financial reporting standards. They are here to stay. I said they're used in more than 140 jurisdictions the skills you have are quite transferable from one country to another. And, uh, you know, a few more countries will definitely adopt IFRS in the future. The accounting standards themselves, they tend to be complex. There's no question about it. Um, the way they are drafted, you do need to read them and then you need to understand them. Um, if you actually have to prepare financial statements. This is just a bit of a joke that I came across the other day. Uh, we're saying, can you do another draft? Because there's still a couple of sentences people might understand. Um, but I, I, I think in terms of IFRS, if you think about opportunities, you can, you know, with that knowledge, one thing is certain, you're probably working with large companies most likely listed companies because they are the ones who are required to prepare IFRS or India's financial statements. So you can be employed in corporate, um, become more of an IFRS specialist, uh, doing more the technical accounting side of things. Yeah. Uh, you also have opportunities in practice. I would say generally the big, the top you know, top five, top 10 firms, uh, they would have clients who need to follow IFRS and uh, you can join that practice uh, becoming a specialist in there. Outside of accounting, financial reporting also, I've done training, a lot of training for people in tax, people in uh, IT, because systems and processes in a finance function are important. Uh, top management who need to understand the financial statements and be able to explain it uh, to, to the investors um, uh, and so on. So um, I think, um, you know, the opportunities are, are huge uh, in, in this area. Uh, but you have to have passion for it. You have to like it. It's a technical area. If you plan to take more a technical uh, path in your career rather than a leadership role, then I think you can go quite in depth into 
these, but it's not, it's definitely not something you can ignore uh, if you aspire to work for a mid to large corporate or service clients in that sector. Uh, how do you get into IFRS? I think, uh, and I'll be very honest here, uh, the best way to learn is on the job. Yeah, so if you're doing your articleship or if you're employed somewhere, ask your uh, line manager to get you involved in IFRS or in DS. That is the best way to learn. And once you are doing it, then you probably read more about it. Standards would make more sense to you and so on. If you don't know anything about it, but is perhaps something that interests you, I mean, a, a good structured way to start is perhaps do a short certificate course on IFRS. Um, there are a lot of institutes that offer that. I think ICAI offers the India certificate only for members. But you, if you're not a member, then you can look at other professional bodies. ACCA offer IFRS certificate. You can do it from your home. It's an online assessment, one hour. And, uh, you know, uh, you get the result uh, after that. So, uh, you know, quite, quite straightforward, but it will give you a good basic understanding of IFRS. I myself, when I was employed with the bank, they sponsored to do uh, my uh, IFRS certificate from the Institute of Chartered Accountants, England, Wales. So that's what I have done. Now, ACCA also offers a diploma in IFRS, which is very, very popular. Personally, I think it's, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's quite advanced. So in that sense, it is good, but uh, also uh, it's, it's a tough exam, you know, you know, two and a half, three hours, you are sitting down and writing, um, you know, and preparing a balance sheet. Now, if you're doing your CA exams, you probably are used to it. But, you know, I've, I, I used to teach on that in India. And what I found with many people, brilliant people, smart people, but after having worked in the industry for five or 10 years and not used to writing because everything's automated, uh, they struggled in those papers. I would say, keep it simple, start with a certificate course. It's cheaper, it's easier, and it will give you a good basic understanding, but try and get into that field. So whatever you plan to do, whether it's IFRS, NDAS, tax, uh, whatever is your passion, try and get work. I mean, the best way is to learn is by doing it. You know, if you spend time on accumulating degrees, uh, it's fine, but, uh, you know, you should, you should make sure that uh, it is worth it. You know, that, that is the main thing. Uh, planning is very important. And this is, um, you know, quite a well-known person here who said, most people plan their vacations with better care than they do their lives. So I think, um, you know, I think um, he asked a question about, about these topics. And I think it's very much relevant uh, uh, that uh, you plan, you have clarity on what you want to do. When you are young, when you are in your 20s, you can perhaps switch. I you know, I worked for a brief period with PwC in Mumbai. And by the way, I'm from Baroda. I qualified as a chartered accountant in Baroda 20 years back. But um, uh, I went to PwC. That was my first job in Mumbai. And I was there for a few, few months before moving to UK. And I remember, and I'm in still touch with him, that, you know, the, the, um, my boss was, uh, you know, he was in audit. I was in audit, he was in audit. And later he moved to transfer pricing and he's now a partner with another big four firm in, in transfer pricing tax. So when you are young, when you are in your 20s, it's possible to switch. But later, as you specialize, it becomes more difficult. It's possible, but it becomes more difficult. So have the clarity in what you want to do. Just think about, you know, would you like tax? Would you like accounts? Would you like audit? Or maybe just something different that you might like to do. Um, and again, you know, I think it's important that uh, you network uh, with people, uh, get to know people in area, talk to them. If you have any questions on IFRS, you know, feel free, as I said, connect with me on LinkedIn, feel free to ask anytime. Uh, all, all, you know, all, all those things um, uh, matter a lot. Networking mat matters a lot. 
what you don't want is to be stuck with a boss who is old fashioned. Uh, here you see that the boss, you've been shown a floppy disk, uh, while uh, the, the, the uh, other side is a USB. Uh, and obviously you don't want to be stuck with a floppy disk uh, to be very blunt uh, with you on that. Um, so think about what you like. Don't worry too much about the noise that is around you. Uh, you know, try and get clarity on what you would like to do. If you decide to do ACC, a diploma in IFRS or a certificate in IFRS uh, or anything else, why is it that you want to do and chalk out a plan? What will you do after that? You know, you think you do that and you get a job, but that might need taking some more steps, maybe moving outside of Baroda into a bigger city. Are you willing to do that? Are you adaptable? Uh, are you able to learn? Are you able to, you know, uh, network? Uh, the world, is out, uh, world out there is very competitive, but I think I always tell people, you know, find your niche and the earlier you find it, the better it is. I mean, I went into IFRS, you know, a few years after qualifying as a chartered accountant. But when I saw the opportunity, I, I really liked it. And today, if you think about me, I mean, the people, there are a lot of people who train on IFRS, but there are less people who train on IFRS for banks or IFRS for insurance. So that's where I get called upon to do a lot of work. So I think um, having having that clarity is important. And, um, you know, look at people, I, I, you know, again, when I was, I was growing up in Baroda, I mean, the people who told me that, look, when you grow up, you have to compete with people from bigger cities who've got more exposure. And the only way you can do that is, is, you know, be in the city you are and try and work with bigger clients, bigger uh, firms, uh, or in new areas, or you move to a bigger city if you find the right opportunity. And let me tell you, I worked with PwC in Mumbai, not that I really liked the work I did. I, I did get a bit fed up quite soon, but then at least it was a good learning that about what I don't want to do rather than what I want to do. So I think just to summarize, make sure you find the area that you are interested in, perhaps is your passion, uh, whether it's to do with audit assurance, financial analysis, tax, what type of tax. Talk to people who actually are doing that. Yeah, And if you're not sure, talk to them, ask them what does it involve, what are the challenges, what are the issues, uh, what are the satisfactions of doing those things. Yeah. So I like teaching and that's why I do a lot of corporate training on IFRS. So find that niche, I would say. And, um, you know, um, a lot of the world will go virtual these days. Uh, of, you know, it is virtual these days and will continue to be virtual. So, you know, look beyond you know, your uh, the cities or the states or the countries you are in, because a lot of things are done virtually and uh, you may be able to get a different perspective. So keep an open mind with regards to with regards to those things. Um, I, we offer certificate courses uh, and uh, IFRS, obviously the, we can prepare you for a, a ACC as IFRS certificate but there's also a certificate in public sector accounting standards. So again, you know, that's something you can look at. Public sector is quite big. A lot of public sector in India is still old fashioned accounting, unlike the private sector. Would you like to get into that, uh, get in there? Um, and if you don't want to work in government, then, you know, perhaps as uh, in, in a practice, which is actually servicing the public sector, that could be an option. Um, I've done a lot of public sector work for governments in Africa, and, um, you know, uh, the, the potential is huge. We also do blockchain cybersecurity and data analysis uh, and data audit, data analytics. So these are again, online e-learning certificate courses on blockchain cybersecurity, data analytics, uh, which, uh, you know, if you want to have a chat about it, do let me know, because look, cybersecurity is another area. You know, if everyone's virtual, everyone's online, this is going to be a big thing. Blockchain technology may be a big thing. 
you know so and then there's data analytics also which already many firms are using so again some of these new age topics is what you might want to consider um, there's a lot of people do gst and a lot of people do audits but these are the new age areas and you don't need to do a long-winded degree and spend loads of money short certificate courses don't cost you much so look into those i mean we have accredited courses so if you need more information just email uh, me or message me and one thing i like to also say is um, from experience is you know we all are very good with technical skills what we lack is the soft skills side of things yeah the managerial skills so what we have is also a world class manager program and this is basically to help finance accounting professionals become good managers. Yeah? So whether you are in your third year of articleship or you qualify as a chartered accountant, you might be managing some people. Are you an effective manager? Do you conduct meetings effectively? Do you set goals for the team? Yeah. If you are a leader or a senior manager, are you strategic in your thinking? So we have a, a partnership, this for this program uh, we can offer it and um, in fact what i would say is um, we have a webinar on tuesday this tuesday uh, the details are there it's on remote management and upskilling so you know we all are now working remotely a lot of us are and that might continue so there is remote working remote management and remote learning in the new world so that's what um, Wayne Clark, who is the founder of World Class Manager, and I are going to talk about on Tuesday. It's a free webinar. You are free to attend. And if you are interested in this side of things, and I would strongly urge you whether you attend this or not uh, is not relevant to me. But if you can do attend, it will give you uh, some tips on remote working. It's free. And uh, uh, the link to register is given uh, is given there. What I would definitely say is, you know, if I was looking for a chartered accountant, I was looking for an accountant, part qualified accountant, what would I look for? Well, yes, technical skills are important, but mostly when you are a part qualified or a qualified accountant, you do have those technical skills. But somebody who has knowledge about some new age topics, somebody who is uh, 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 somebody somebody who has good communication skills, managerial abilities, along with the technical skills would stand out. So what I like you to think about is what is it that differentiates you from the others? What is it that differentiates you from, you know, all the others, the noise that is out there? So think about it. But I would say if you are a chartered accountant with great communication skills, you will be dem in demand globally because after a certain level, you know, it's more about your ability to manage, lead, delegate, inspire, motivate. That's what matters. Yeah. And those skills cannot be acquired uh, in six months or one year. It has to start at an early age. So public speaking skills, debating skills, all those are very important. Yeah. Uh, the technical side of things, things keep changing, you know, tax laws, IFRS, everything keeps changing and we've acquired the skills to learn them, but do develop this side of it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, feel free to attend uh, that webinar. We'll send you the link. And uh, as I said, yeah, if we are on YouTube, so if you follow the YouTube channel, just search for Square Mile Global Consulting, you'll find IFRS videos. Um, they are free, so feel free to do so. And uh, um, yeah, if there's anything I can help with or guide you on, then do email me. Um, any questions? Because we finished everything now, so. Um, Yeah, I think uh, the questions were mainly around future prospects for IFRS. I've kind of touched upon it. Technology 
role of technology in future of CA. I think that is huge. Um, uh, you know, and that's why I referred to cybersecurity, blockchain, data analytics. You know, how do you do audits remotely? Uh, if you if you if you can be strong in that area or different uh, to others in that area, then you know that can give you an edge. Um, will technology or robots robots able to substitute CAs? I think uh, it it really depends, but and this is where I talk about the leadership managerial side of things. You know, uh, the the routine work, the accounting audit work could be replaced, uh, but you know, client relationships, managing clients, building good relationships, managing teams, robots can't really do that effectively. So those skills are important. And um, profession skills in most demand in the upcoming future and some advice for the future. I think I've, I've kind of given you some guide. Uh, I wouldn't say I'm an expert on uh, advising for the future. It really depends on your passion. And you know, beyond a point, if you're doing things which you're not passionate about, it will be hard to progress. Uh, so find your passion and, and follow that. You know, I, I know people who started doing accounting and they felt, well, they don't really like it. And they said, oh, I want to go into digital marketing. Now that's great. But remember when you go into things like digital marketing, you go into areas which MBAs are into, you are just opening up the world of competition. Yeah, because there's lots of people uh, with skills um, other than what CAs have also doing the same thing. So you got to compete with those people also. Uh, yeah, we will be sharing uh, the slides. Um, let me just check if I can try and uh, uh, let me share the webinar uh, link. Uh, just one second. Uh, so I'll just stop sharing the screen. I just want to bring up that webinar link, uh, which might be useful. So give me one, give me a few seconds. I'll just share the webinar link. Um, Yes, yeah, so I've just shared that webinar link um, and make sure you um, copy that on your computers. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? No, if you don't, then uh, thank you very much for uh, attending and spending your Sunday. Uh, if you think any of your friends or colleagues might also benefit from attending that webinar on remote working and upskilling, then uh, feel free to forward the link to, to them. And as I said, you can connect with me on LinkedIn uh, and uh, drop me an email anytime. And if you have any suggestions or would like more of such sessions uh, on uh, IFRS, uh, then uh, please do get in touch with the Vikasa team. Yeah, but thank you very much for attending.